that. I Good afternoon from Nigeria. I assume everybody can hear me. Good. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Shario Samuel, and uh, I'm a researcher in the Department of Animal Breeding and Genetics, Federal University of Agriculture, Abiokuta, Ogun State in Nigeria. And uh, my area of interest is behavioral genetics. So you are welcome to Animal Welfare Group Nigeria with acronym AWGN. AWGN was founded after a gathering of students and lecturers in 2019. Our missions are to increase awareness of animal behavior and welfare in Nigeria and Africa. We are also trying to foster collaboration and networking among researchers who are into animal welfare and behavior. We are trying to also educate public on importance of animal welfare. And we meet every fortnight, every, every two, two weeks, every Wednesdays to discuss issues that are related to animal welfare and behavior. People from different parts of the world, such as Canada, UK, Portugal, Netherlands, Australia, and Nigeria have presented on issues that are related to ethical practices, fear, stress, cognition, uh, neuroscience, and exercise in animal, both in livestock and in fish. Our uh, up-to-date starting, starting scientists have presented 14 talks on animal welfare and behavior. Today's presentation is the first inaugural lecture of the group, and the moderator for today's inaugural lecture is Dr. Oluwashim Sera Iyasere of the Department of Animal Physiology, Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta, Ogun State in Nigeria. She is also the coordinator of the group. And today's presenter is Emeritus Professor Donald Broom, the first professor of animal welfare in the world. Donald Broom will be talking on animal welfare in relation to sentience, sustainability, and other concepts. I would love to hand over to the moderator to continue from this session. Very much. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. Today is a very great day because we have the privilege of having uh, in our midst the first professor of animal welfare in the world, Emeritus Professor Donald M. Broom. I hope that this, that Professor Broom's presentation today will inspire ideas and discussions related to animal welfare issues. Before I take the biography of the presenter, I would like to give few rules related to today's meeting. I would like all participants to please mute their mic and also turn off their video to prevent distractions. And any question that you have for our inaugural lecturer, kindly drop that in the chat box. I will take the question immediately after his presentation. Donald M. Broom is Emeritus Professor of Animal Welfare at the Cambridge University Department of Veterinary Medicine. He graduated in he graduated in Cambridge in 1964, then gained his PhD in animal behavior in 1967 and taught at Reading University until 1986, when he became the first professor in animal welfare in the world. His research is on scientific assessment of animal welfare, cognitive abilities of animals, ethics and sustainable farming. He was chairman or vice chairman of EU scientific committees on animal welfare between 1990 and 2012. And he has published 380 refereed papers and 12 books, including Stress and Animal Welfare, The Evolution of Morality and Religion, Sentience and Animal Welfare, Animal Welfare in the European Union, Tourism and Animal Welfare, and Domestic Animal Behavior and Welfare. Today, join me in welcoming Professor Donald Broom as he gave us the first inaugural lecture. Over to you, Prof. I, I'm going to going to um, say something about all of these different concepts, and I hope I am going to uh, provoke you and ask and say things to you which will make you uh, think and make you argue with me. 
So I'm very happy to have a discussion about all of these things. Uh, and uh, some things are, are, will be very familiar to you, and, uh, uh, but others you, you might disagree with. And I'm very happy if you want to say something, if you want to disagree. And uh, and now I'm just trying to make the slide go forward and it's not doing it, so why not? Okay, it worked. Uh, so attitudes to non-human animals have been changing. Uh, and this has happened because uh, we are working in a situation where there is an idea of humans as being something like the top of a pyramid and every other kind of animal is something lower and less important than humans. And the idea that there is a very large difference between humans and other species. But there has been a lot of research, a lot of scientific research in recent years, which shows that the similarities between humans and non-human animals are uh, much greater than most people have thought. Of course, humans have some abilities that are better than certain other species, but other species have abilities which are better than human abilities in a wide range of ways. And so we, and we know more about that now uh, than we did uh, at, at one time in the past. Uh, so if you actually ask people about the welfare of animals, uh, and these are, this has been done with surveys like the Eurobarometer survey, in which large numbers of people in a number of European countries are asked, uh, asked questions. Uh, they say animal welfare is something which is very important. And this is, it, it seems to happen everywhere where people are asked this question. So if you do the survey in Spain, or you do the survey in China, you get a similar result that about 90% of people say, this is something very important to me, and I am thinking about this. Uh, and the result of this, and this is, it is more frequent now that people say animal welfare is something which is important. The welfare of the animals we use as farm animals or companion animals or laboratory animals, and the welfare of wild animals, all of these things are regarded as more important. And so the range of animals which are thought of as being the subjects of moral concern is increasing. People are concerned about more kinds of animals now than they were, and it's mainly because of increase in scientific knowledge on the subject. One of the consequences of this is that we ought to change our language. We ought to change our language if we are changing our knowledge. Uh, here's an example of it. Now, in, in the last 10 to 15 years, there has been a really dramatic change in what we know about gene expression. And the thing which has changed is that we now know, particularly from epigenetics research, we now know that when, when you are producing, when a gene is acting, a gene is causing proteins to be produced and organisms to be produced, cells and whole organisms, that at every single stage of gene expression, the environment can alter it. Now that means that all characteristics of people all characteristics of all organisms are affected by the genetics, but also by the environment. There is nothing which is independent of the environment. So it is not correct to talk about something being genetically determined if that means not affected by the environment. It is not correct to say something is instinctive. Nothing is instinctive, nothing is innate. And that's quite a big change from how people were thinking even 30 years ago. So it's just an example of where developments in scientific knowledge are changing how people ought to actually use words, how they should describe things. So the next general point is that the terms we are talking about today, welfare, health, stress, uh, and so on, these concepts are exactly the same for humans and non-humans. They don't Human welfare is not some, does not mean something different from pig welfare or cow welfare or dog welfare. Welfare means the same thing, whatever species we are talking about. Uh, and this is one of the things which has been a part of the uh, One Health and One Welfare initiatives. They have emphasized that these terms like welfare and stress and health and pain, they mean the same thing 
for all species, humans and other species. Humans are not uh, different. I mean, they, are, they differ, but they are, the, the concepts mean the same things. So stress means the same thing for a human or for a fish like a jalapia. So we ought to use words in the same way for humans and other species. Again, I will give you an example of a, where people often don't use the word in the same way. It, the word euthanasia is used for humans. Uh, it's a concept which is not an easy one. That is, are there times uh, when an individual should, uh, should be killed because they are, their life is, uh, is so bad? They are in such enormous pain that they don't want to continue with their life. It's a controversial idea, but we do use the word for humans. So what does euthanasia of a human mean? And what does euthanasia of, of a dog mean? Or what does euthanasia of a laboratory rat mean? Well, what it should mean is the same thing for all of these species. So it should mean killing an individual for the benefit of that individual and in a humane way, avoiding suffering. If the benefit is from, for someone else, then it's not euthanasia. It can still be humane killing. It can be killing in a humane way, but it's, it's not euthanasia if it's not for the benefit of that individual. And so I would advocate that we should stop using euthanasia. For example, I have a dog. I am fed up with having a dog. I don't want a dog anymore. I'm going to kill the dog. That's not euthanasia. I hope it would be done in a humane way but it's not euthanasia because it's not for the benefit of the dog. But if you say, I have a dog, the dog has, has a really dreadful disease condition, which is causing a very large amount of suffering. And I think it would be the kindest thing to do for the dog to, to die because the suffering is so great. That's euthanasia. Uh, okay, so that's, that this is then, a, 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 all of this is part of the general principle, one health, one welfare and one biology. Everybody here is aware that biology is a, a, a subject, a principle, and the, the, you can talk about the biology of any species, but that we are still talking about the same biological processes. There is only one biology. So human biology isn't different from the, the biology of, of, of fish. Uh, the, the biological principles are the same, whatever the species. And that, of course, we have used for a very long time in that we have used laboratory animals in studies of uh, drugs which might be used for humans or to understand mechanisms. Uh, most of what we know about the functioning of humans has come from studies of other species, and that depends upon the mechanisms actually being largely the same. It doesn't mean everything is the same in every species, but most of the mechanisms are the same. So if there's only one biology, if what happens in humans is the same as what happens in other species, then does this change our attitudes to the other species? But what do we do about it? Well, one thing we do about it is we have laws. We have laws to control our interactions with non-human animals. We have laws to try to preserve the world environment. And we ought to try to think about preserving the world environment and not just the environment that humans use. Because the big problem in the world at the moment, and it's been around a long time, but it's, I think it's worse now than probably than it was a thousand years ago in Europe or, or, or a shorter time ago in some countries, is that we are too centered on humans. We are too selfish. We are thinking too much about only one species, our species, and not thinking enough about all other species. And so this raises the general question, uh, are humans special in some way? And I would say, well, humans are different from other species. Every species is different from every other species, but humans are not special. They are just one of the species in the world. There's nothing special about humans. There's nothing which means that humans should be protected more than everything else, except that we tend to want to preserve our own species more. But uh, in, in overall, humans should not be regarded as, as special. Okay, so that then takes me to what are the problems in the world today? I just put this here for, for you to uh, think about or argue with. So I would say that at the moment in the world in general, the largest problem is the selfish, unplanned human use of world resources, which causes harms to animals, harms to the environment. Some of those 
harms our actions which cause climate change. So I think for the world in general, that's the biggest problem in the world. Uh, that is, we have uh, diseases, we have diseases which are, have been controlled by uh, antibiotics and other antimicrobials for a long time, and there's very rapid development of resistance to these uh, antimicrobials. And that is a very important problem. Also, we had new diseases. You may have noticed this. <laughs> we have a new diseases at, disease at the moment caused by careless exploitation of other species. So I would say that for humans, antimicrobial resistance and new diseases caused by careless exploitation of other species is the number one issue. And uh, then the other one is the, is the whole world damage because of human actions. And these are more important things than something like terrorism or hunger or corruption. Those are also important, but they're less important. Okay. So just to say something about antimicrobial, I think most people in the audience will know it already, but we have a situation where, for example, tuberculosis is a major disease in the world. It always has been important, but because of, of, of antibiotics, it became rather less important and it's become more important again because we have resistant strains of, of, of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And just to say how important is it? Well, uh, in 2020, it caused 1.6 million human deaths. And that is not very different from the deaths caused by COVID-19, 1.8 million. Uh, perhaps a, a bit more than that if everything is counted. But, but just to say tuberculosis is almost, even in the last year, it was almost as important as COVID-19. And there are lots of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, and these are, these are causing major problems. And actually the worst problems are being caused uh, in, in Africa. Uh, the worst uh, of these problems are, are being caused in Africa. So uh, what's going to happen in the future? Well, if nothing is done about this and people don't change their behavior and change how they use antimicrobials, uh, it could, could cause very many more deaths. I mean, it's being predicted that maybe 20 or 50 million deaths uh, would be caused by it if nothing is done. So we have to actually change our practices in relation to the use of antimicrobials, uh, in relation to therapeutic use on farms and particularly how individual humans are using antibiotics, for example, allowing it to be sold in a shop with no medical prescription. That is a disastrous thing to happen. People putting antibiotics in, into the sewage system, that is a disastrous thing to do because it encourages the de development of, of uh, resistant strains. Also, we need actions to prevent new pandemics. And so a lot of that is to regulate interactions between species, in particular between humans and other species. So we need to regulate disturbance of wild animals, collecting, killing. In some cases, we need to ban activities which are permitted at the moment. In other cases, it can be done by license. In other cases, we need to protect humans, protect domestic animals, protect one species against another species because the transfer of, of pathogens is occurring too readily at the moment. Okay, now let's go to the concept of sustainability. So we would all say, I think, that we have obligations to the animals that we use. We have and obligations to Systems ought to be sustainable. So what does that mean? So a system or procedure is sustainable if that system is acceptable now to, to, to people in general, and if it's expected future effects are acceptable, and that refers to things like the availability of resources, the consequences of the functioning of the system, the morality of the actions which are occurring. So that's what sustainability is about. So what makes a production system, and let's think about food production in particular, but it also relates to all other kinds of production, what makes a production system unsustainable? And if it is unsustainable, that means that the quality of the product is judged as poor by, by uh, consumers because consumers won't buy things if they think they come from unsustainable systems. And this is something which is developing very rapidly in many countries now. 
So a system might be unsustainable because of adverse effects on human welfare, including human health, uh, well, but poor welfare of animals, uh, some genetic modification, which is regarded as unacceptable, uh, any one of a range of harmful environmental effects, including climate change, pollution, and so on. Uh, the inefficient usage of world resources is something which people are starting to say, this, this is a lot of waste. We're wasting a lot of things. We're not using world resources very efficiently. And then there are uh, fair trade schemes, which are developed very rapidly in, in Europe and, 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 and other, some other countries where people are saying it isn't acceptable for producers in poor countries to get a very small amount of money and for a lot of money for a product to go to a, a, lot, a commercial company which is dealing with it. Uh, so a fair trade scheme means that when I go to the shops now, Every supermarket has fair trade labels on things like coffee and chocolate and bananas and other products, and people are only buying fair things with a fair trade label. And then there are general effects of, 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 of systems, food production systems in particular, on communities, especially rural communities. So sometimes systems are not acceptable because they have too much damage on a human community. So what we need to do in relation to sustainability is to consider all of the components of systems. And in order to do that, we need a scoring system. And that is something which I uh, have written about. Uh, so we need to have efficient, we need to have good information, good quality scientific information on all these different aspects of sustainability, animal welfare being one of them. Um, and then we need to be able to use that uh, and understand what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. So there are systems which are actually much more sustainable than others. And what is shown here is, is a, a silvopastoral system where uh, grazing animals are not just eating pasture plants, they are eating shrubs with high protein leaves and sometimes trees with high protein leaves. And these kinds of systems are uh, better in many ways than straightforward um, single layer grazing systems. Uh, because you get better production, you get better welfare for the animals, you get a more biodiverse environment, uh, uh, and the whole thing can, in some circumstances, work very well. So I think there's going to be a complete revolution in agriculture around the world. We're going to be, in many places, moving away from single, from just having pasture plants and moving to having, having shrubs and trees as part of the food. Um, so it's just an example of one of the ways in which things might change. Here, here's another example. This is just a picture of a place where uh, the, the, the straw which was present after a cereal was grown has been burnt. Well, you can do other things than burn it. Burning causes some immediate problems. It, 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 it produces a lot of carbon dioxide for a start and other kinds of pollution. And also you could use it for, for example, to improve the lives of pigs. Uh, they're, 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 so you need to think about another different example is uh, taking animals from the wild and selling them either within a country or to other countries. Uh, the, 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 selling, the selling of uh, birds has now been banned in the European Union and it's banned mainly because it was discovered that most of the birds which are being caught in the wild, less than 10% of them survive in order to be sold. 90% of them die, even for very large valuable birds like big parrots, 80% of them die. And that was considered unacceptable and so the European Union banned it, which is a, I think an important thing for the world because it stops people Catching, catching wild animals. And there's still quite a lot of wild animals being caught. It's just an example of something which, which can be done. Here, here is another example. Uh, we keep animals as pets, like dogs. Do you know that uh, more than half of all the dogs in the world are not being kept in people's houses? They are living in feral conditions. They are living in semi-wild conditions. And this is a, a substantial predator. So we keep dogs and cats as pets. Dogs and cats are really important predators of wild animals. And so what happens when they are released into the wild? They are killing lots of wild animals. That is the responsibility of the humans who initiated it. 
So I think it, 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 it is wrong that animals are allowed, pre predatory animals are allowed to go into the wild and kill things without any control. Also, they are tending to spread disease within their own populations and, uh, and in other populations. So an action like keeping pets and then releasing them into the wild is something which is a very damaging thing and should not be allowed to happen in my view. So what do you do about it? We can talk about that. Okay, let's consider animal welfare then. So this term welfare and welfare of animals and well, animals includes humans, of course, uh, it, welfare is only used for animals. It's not used for plants. It's not used for inanimate objects. It's used for, for organisms which have complex coping systems dealing with the world in which they live. So the welfare of an individual is its state as regards its attempts to cope with its environment. And that involves quite a wide range of different systems. And I'm not going to go into that in detail, uh, but uh, you will appreciate that there are many different aspects of how to cope with the world in which you live, most of which are controlled by the brain. There are other components in the body, but the brain is a very important part of this. And welfare then is something which varies. It's not, it varies over time. And welfare can be very good, welfare can be very poor, but, and we can measure it. We can measure it in a scientific way. Uh, here's another term which is widely used, and that is stress. And here's a definition of stress. So stress, I think, is best used as an environmental effect on an individual which overtaxes its control systems and results in adverse consequences, eventually reduced fitness. So it's, I don't think the word stress is useful if you just use it as a stimulus which activates control mechanisms. So if you if you call any 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 effect of the environment on an individual stress, it's not the word is useless. So you should limit it to effects which are negative uh, in the long run. And also saying that stress is just activation of one control system, the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortex axis, that's not a useful thing to do. If you, that's what you mean, then you can say that. It's more scientific to say that it's HPA axis activity. But using this definition of stress, you can see that when there is stress, then the welfare of the individual will be, will be poor. Well, we now have a wide range of scientific measures of the welfare of individuals, and also we have a whole animal is going to live somewhere, what are its needs? That's an essential thing to know if you're going to try to keep it in, in captivity. And um, we need, we want to know what the needs are for every kind of animal. And we have lots of scientific evidence on this now. And so this concept of needs is the fundamental thing when you are trying to design conditions for keeping any kind of animal. Uh, we previously used the concept of freedoms. Uh, that's been a useful guide, but it, it is very general. And it's now really replaced by the more scientific concept of needs. So uh, thinking about and understanding the scientific evidence for what animals need is very important. You, you can't keep it, you can't transport it, you can't interact with it unless you know what it needs. We also have the other, another term, which is the three R's, which is mainly being to do with animals in laboratories. And the welfare aspect is the refinement. So we ought to be trying to uh, refine the methodologies which we use in, in laboratories. Uh, here's an example of where, uh, where animal welfare is being measured in a scientific way. And what is shown here is what happens over a journey when a, a group of sheep are loaded onto a transport vehicle, and then they are transported down a road, uh, and, and then eventually uh, they are taken off the vehicle. And what you can in fact see here is that if you measure the uh, cortisol in those animals, when they are loaded onto the vehicle, there is a very large increase in cortisol. Loading is a very disturbing thing for sheep or for other animals which have not been on a, a road vehicle before. So you can see that measurement of cortisol gives you information about how difficult, how challenging that situation is. Loading is a problem. And then you can see that the cortisol concentration in the in the blood or saliva or whatever of the animal declines over a period of hours 
and then it goes back to the baseline level. And this is these are animals which are being driven on a very good quality road, very smooth road. And then at the end of the journey, uh, there's a period when they are moved off a good quality road and they go on to a, a poor quality road with a lot of bends and rougher road and the cortisol goes up again. So this is just demonstrating that measurement of cortisol can give you information about the welfare of an animal during a transport journey. Again, I'm sure many people are extremely familiar with this. Here, here's another kind of measurement. Uh, this is a measurement of behavior uh, in an individual which is being caused pain. And this, these sheep, pain, uh, sometimes the, the, the pain was because uh, a, an operation was carried out on the sheep. Sometimes it's because they had a disease condition. And what was found is, was that the sheep uh, change the facial expression when they are in pain. And the way in which they change their facial expression is actually the same as happens with uh, a number of other species. So if somebody sticks a pin into your leg right now, how do you change your face? I think you change your face by a grimace. You, you screw up your face. And you see the picture of the human baby who is experiencing something which is painful. And what we have found in looking at a wide range of species is that this is shown by rats and mice. It's shown by horses. It's shown by sheep. It's shown by rabbits. It's shown by a whole range of different kinds of animals. So there, there is this grimace response, screwing up the face, which can be quantified and measured accurately. Uh, so it's a measure. It's a measure of pain of acute pain and of, so of pain which is present at, at, at the time. Uh, and it's just an example of, of a behavioral measure. There are many other behavioral and physiological measures which can be used in assessing welfare. So this concept of welfare then refers to a range of coping mechanisms, mechanisms for trying using the brain to keep the body and the brain in a stable state. That's what coping is about. And these mechanisms are physiological, behavioral, and of course they include the changes in the brain. So we use the term feeling, we use the word pain. I mean, pain, pain includes a, a feeling which we have when we, uh, we ex have the, a certain experience. Responses to pathology are also an important part of, uh, of welfare. So, all, so this means that uh, feelings are adaptive mechanisms to try to deal with what is happening in life, positive and negative feelings. They are essential things to try to measure in evaluating welfare. We also want to know how much pathological state, how much other adaptation the individual is having to carry out to try to cope with what is happening. But I'm just stressing that feelings are a key part of welfare, but they are not all of it, they are part of it. So animal welfare scientists then are combining behavioral and other measures, and that's, that's what welfare assessment is all about. We also have the word well-being, which basically means the same as welfare, but tends to be thought of as a, a more scientific term. How does this relate to the concept of health? Well, health is a key part of welfare. It's not something separate from welfare. Uh, if, if your health is poor, your welfare is going to be poor. And so you can't, if, if you, it's not really logical to talk about health and welfare because health is a part of welfare. So health is that part of the state of the individual, which is to do with pathology and attempts to cope with pathology. So welfare is a wider term than health, but health is a very important part of welfare. And some of the older definitions like the World Health Organization's definition of health is out of date. It was written in 1940 something and it's not uh, very good now, but health is obviously important. Everybody here will know it. Here is a picture of a bird which is sick. It, is, it, it has malaise, it has sickness, and clearly the welfare of this, this bird is not good. And there are many other examples, of course, where, where um, unhealthy individuals have poor welfare, but sometimes the health may be a little bit impacted and the welfare is only a little bit impacted. Yeah. I, I would emphasize that welfare is a characteristic of an individual animal. So you can talk about the welfare of an individual 
You could also talk about the average welfare of individuals in a population, but you can't talk about the welfare of a population. And you can't talk about the welfare of something other than an animal. Uh, we also have the term animal protection. That's a human action, of course, something that humans do. Another term is quality of life. Quality of life also means welfare, but it's not used for short term things. So you wouldn't talk about, oh, I pricked my finger. This is damaging my quality of life, because actually in one hour's time, you may have forgotten that you pricked your finger. But we use quality of life for things which go on for a longer period. But basically, it means welfare. That's what it means. And you can use the same scientific measures for welfare and for quality of life. And so we have a range of laws in many countries which are to do with welfare. And one of the things which happened in the European Union was that at quite an early stage in a treaty, they referred to the animals which are used uh, on farms as companion animals and so on, laboratory animals, as being sentient beings. So this leads me then to what is meant by sentient being. And I'm going to spend quite a lot of time talking about that. So here is a pig that pig has a very complex brain. It has very complex mechanisms for working out how to interact with other pigs, for working out how to manage its interactions with its physical environment. Um, and that pig at the moment is looking at the observer because this is actually a sow which has piglets and the pig, the sow is evaluating whether the human observer is a danger to the piglets. So that animal is pr predicting what might happen in the future and trying to work out a strategy to deal with it. And th these are complicated things to do. And these animals which we keep as farm animals are very complex beings. So which animals ought to be protected? Uh, should we protect, as I've mentioned, the welfare refers to all animals, but some animals are more complex than others. Uh, I think we would say that if we keep animals, and it's now expressed in some laws that we have a duty of care to the animals which we keep. But it raises the question of should sentient animals have more protection than animals which are not sentient? Okay, let me say what I mean by sentience. So sentience means having the capacity, the awareness and cognitive ability necessary to have feelings, positive and negative feelings like uh, pain, fear, anxiety, and the various forms of pleasure. So which animals have the capacity uh, to have feelings? You can appreciate that not all of them do. So let's start by what abilities are needed to have this capacity. Well, here is a list of some of them. You need to be able to evaluate what you are doing, what other individuals are doing, how those, uh, interact how those things are going to interact. You need to remember what you've done in the past what were the consequences of what you've done in the past and to use that information in order to plan for the future. Because almost all animals we look at have an ability to plan for the future. The idea that only humans can do this is nonsense. You need to be able to assess the risks and the benefits of a particular situation. What, what is going to happen? How positive or negative is it? What can I do about it? And in order to do this, you have to have some degree of awareness of what is happening, who you are, what you are doing, what other individuals are doing, how they are going to in, are interacting with you and how they will interact with you. What is going to happen in your physical environment? Is it a problem or not? These are all aspects of your awareness of the world in which you live. So which animals can do that? Uh, and what and we now look at a range of animals and we look at what they can do and to what extent they are aware of what is happening, to what extent they are planning for what they have to do in order to deal with problems which they can calculate from their previous experience. And so all of these animals can do it to some extent, but uh, there, is, there is variation in it, but uh, we now know, the more we know about different species, the more we discover that they can do more things than we thought. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. But the term sent we are saying, do they have this capacity? Do they have this capacity to have feelings or don't they have it? And if they haven't got it, they are not sentient animals. So let's consider which animals are sentient. Okay, let's start by which humans are sentient. Are all humans sentient? Well, 
I think it must be very obvious to you that they aren't because you are a human when you are a, a, a zygote, you are a fertilized egg. And then a fertilized egg is developing and during embryological development, the development of a, of a fetus, uh, then there is a point when the individual has these capabilities, but there is also a point when they don't have them. So during early development, a human or, 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 a, or a pig or a, a, a trout, uh, they are not, they're not sentient at the beginning and then they become sentient. Also, there can be damage to the brain. This could be dementia, it could be physical damage to the individual and sentience can cease. So you can have a human who is no longer sentient. They no longer have these capacities, uh, but they're still alive. They're still a human, but they're not sentient. Okay, the same applies to all other species that uh, you, you need to know when sentience arises and you need to know what might cause it to stop. So there's been a lot of research on cognitive ability and feelings in a range of species, in humans and in non-humans. And I'm just gonna give a few examples of that. So here, 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 this is basically saying which animals are able to do complex things uh, and uh, what sort of research has been done. Well, here's one example. Uh, this is a bird, a jay in the crow family. Uh, one of the things they do is like a lot of other animals, they have a surplus of food, they hide it, and then they go back later, sometimes weeks or months later, and they find it again. Uh, some mammals do this also. So a range of uh, uh, birds and mammals can do this. But one of the things which was found in this study by Nikki Clayton and Tony Dickinson and Nathan Emery, uh, the research was done here in Cambridge, was that if they hid a nut, a peanut, they would sometimes leave it for a very long time and then go back and find it again. But if they hid something like a, a mealworm, an insect larva, they always came back within a very short time and retrieved it. And the reason for that, of course, is that they are aware that this uh, mealworm larva is going to decay. It, it is okay now, but it will not be food if you leave it for more than a couple of days. So they were differentiating when they hid something between something which would last for a long time and something which would decay. Uh, so that means they have a concept of what's going to happen in the future. Another thing which was noticed in these studies was that if an individual was hiding food, and while it was hiding the food, another of its own species was watching, then what they did was they would hide it, and then they would come back after the other one had gone and take it out and hide it somewhere else, because otherwise they're going to be robbed. Otherwise, the other individual is going to take it from them. So they have a concept of the consequences of the behavior of another individual and what to do to prevent the loss of the resource. Uh, here's another study, which is a rather interesting one, I think. Uh, which animals are capable of understanding numbers? Um, and can, indi can individuals of other species do simple mathematics? Uh, this was a study done uh, in, in Moscow by Olga Smirnova, and she was working with a crow, so again, uh, a member of this, this family of birds, which is very clever generally. And they trained the crows to respond to a number of dots on an object and they would get a reward if they indicated that they had uh, identified how many dots there were. They found that they could very easily uh, distinguish between one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dots. So that was the first bit of it. The next thing they did was to train them to respond to the Arabic numeral one to eight. So we use these symbols for a number, which they, it was possible to train the crow to do this, and they could translate the number of dots to the uh, symbol, the number. So number six was translated to six dots and, uh, and, and so on. Also, if they showed two dots and five dots, then the crow would respond to seven dots. So they were actually adding two dots here, five dots here, respond to seven dots. And if they showed them the numbers two and five, they could respond to the number seven. So that involves some very complicated ideas that these crows are having. What about the animals which we keep as domestic animals? Well, here's one example which came from a study in Cambridge by Keith Kendrick some years ago. And what they did to start with was they uh, recorded from the brains of sheep and they showed them a picture and they found that there were units in the brain which were firing electrically when they only when they saw one particular sheep. 
They only responded, they, well, there were some units which responded to any sheep, and there were other units which only responded to an individual sheep. So it had to be Mary. If it wasn't Mary, the unit in the brain didn't fire. They knew from behavioral studies, discrimination studies, that they could discriminate individual sheep and individual humans. Uh, um, so they, could, they were able to do this, but this was demonstrating that there was a, a unit in the brain which was allowing them to do it. Another kind of study which has been done is to show an animal a resource and then uh, hide, hide it behind, not hide it, but put it behind a fence. And in order to get to the resource, they have to walk around the fence. Now that's something which you can do with young children and see when they learn to do it. There's an age when they can do it. And a whole range of animals have been shown to do this. So dogs, chickens, tortoises, they can learn that you can see the food through the fence, but you have to walk 20 meters that way and 20 meters back again in order to get the food. So that's a detour learning situation. Another thing that people have tried is, can the individual use information from a mirror in order to uh, obtain a resource? Uh, this shows a picture of a study we did where we, we, we demonstrated that pigs could learn what is in a mirror. If they were given five hours of experience of a mirror, then they could go uh, uh, around a barrier in order to find food, uh, which they couldn't have detected without being able to use information from a mirror. Using information from a mirror has been demonstrated now with uh, chimpanzees, uh, some other apes, capuchin monkeys, dolphins, elephants, magpies, parrots, and pig. So it hasn't been demonstrated for some other animals like dogs yet. Um, and humans can do it, it, but humans tend to be taught about mirrors from a very early stage. If they're not taught about mirrors, then they generally can't do it until they're about three years old. A whole lot of studies have been done with uh, African gray parrots. This, this species is uh, very widely studied, although most of the work was done in the United States by uh, one or two particular people. And parrots are very nice subjects for this kind of work because they can make human words, human sounds, which we call words. And we, it makes it easier for a human experimenters to therefore to use parrots. And they found they could train parrots to use a word for 50 different objects, seven colors, five shapes, quantities from one to six. And they could do it either going from the object to the word or the word to the object. So these are th things that can be done. So it shows you the cognitive ability of the animals. Uh, this is a study which we did, which was to see whether there was an emotional response of animals which were learning something. And this was done by Kristin Hagen. And what she did was she uh, put a young cow uh, in uh, a pen uh, where there was a gate in front of it. And there was a food source which they could see through the gate, a familiar uh, food bowl. And what the animal had to do to get through the gate was to put the nose and the hole in the wall. And after a while, they learned to do it. And the, we knew that cows could do things like this. They, they can quite easily learn uh, actions, operant actions like this in order to obtain a, a reward. Um, but what was done in this study was to compare individuals which learned it and individuals which, whatever their actions, they didn't learn it, but they got the same reward. And what was found was that they showed an excitement response when they learned it. They showed a behavior change, they jumped, uh, they, made, they made more uh, noise uh, and they changed their heart rate when they had learned it. And they didn't show those excitement responses if they got the reward without learning it. And they didn't show the excitement response if they had learned it yesterday and they already knew it. And so they could go straight in and open the gate. They didn't show the excitement then. They showed the excitement when they had solved the problem. So it's as if, Eureka, I've solved the problem. Uh, and we did a similar thing with sheep and found that they could do it as well. And there's a study with dogs suggesting that they can as well. They can show excitement when they learn something. Uh, this, is a, this is just because I have so far mostly left, left out fish. There are several studies from fish which show very impressive cognitive abilities. And this is a study of a cleaner wrasse on a coral reef. So this is a small fish which cleans parasites from bigger fish. And what happens is that the bigger fish want to have the parasites removed from them. So they go to a place where there is one of these cleaner wrasse uh, and they queue up, they wait in a queue 
until the cleaner wrasse cleans the parasites off them. But sometimes other fish come up which don't know the rules and they don't wait in the queue. So what does the cleaner wrasse do in that circumstance? What they do is they go to the ephemeral food source, the, the fish which is the, the, the going, only going to be there for a little while before they go to the ones in the queue. And that's advantageous because for the, for the cleaner because it gets more food by doing that because the ones in the queue are going to stay there and wait whereas the other ones are not. And then they did the same thing experimentally. That is they offered plates of food, a permanent source of food and a source of food which will go away if you don't take it very quickly. So an ephemeral source of food and they found that they could learn to take the food from B first. And this, that is from the ephemeral source of food first. And these were fish which had never been on a coral reef. So this species of fish could learn this, this kind of learning task. And then they tried the same learning task on some other species. So the fish learned it within 10 trials to go for the, the food which will go away if you don't take it, rather than the food which is going to stay there. Children, take quite a few trials to learn this. They can learn it, but they take quite a lot of trials, usually more than 10 trials to learn it. Capuchin monkeys took over 100 trials. Chimpanzees took 50 trials or failed. Orangutans took 100 trials or failed. Um, African gray parrots, most of them learned within the same number of trials as the fish. So this is a task which can be done by parrots and can be done by these kinds of fish better than primates. So uh, it, it, it's just, that doesn't mean that these fish can do everything better than primates, but that kind of task they can do. So it just shows that fish can learn some quite complicated things. So let's look at some other kinds of animals and look at what their abilities are. This is animals like octopus, cuttlefish, squid, so animals living in the sea. They can modify their previous learning. They can learn to go through mazes. They have individual differences. They can have route planning, which changes over time according to what is happening. They can show simultaneous different responses to different individuals on the two sides of the body, which we can't normally do. They can use, there are several studies showing they can use tools. They can carry out behavior which de involves deception of other individuals. So these are quite complicated things being done by an invertebrate animal. And then, there are also quite complex things being done by things like lobsters and crabs, decapod crustacea. So hermit crabs are, compete for shells and they can remember which shells they've looked at before. Crabs can show avoidance learning. Spiny lobsters can navigate to their home across the seabed as far as many kilometers uh, away. So there are some quite complicated things that they can do. And if you look at the pain responses of these animals, prawns, who have their antenna treated with acid will increase cleaning unless they are anesthetized. So they're responding to something which is painful. Crabs will avoid a place, a, a shelter where they have received shocks. Uh, hermit crabs will trade off their preferences and their experience of shock. So the, they, they clearly are using uh, what you couldn't say anything other than that they have a pain system. So what animals have a pain system? Well, it's very clear in all vertebrates, including fish. It's clear in crabs and prawns and quite, quite clear in cephalopods, in octopus and squid. So at the moment then, we would say that all vertebrate animals, cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustacea are sentient animals uh, because they have the capability to, to, to have pain and to have quite high level cognitive functioning. What about other animals? Well, actually, Bees and ants are able to form cognitive maps. Ants can count while they are foraging. Cockroaches can so show place learning. Jumping spiders uh, have really impressive cognitive ability. This spider Portia has been shown to look at a maze from above and then be moved out of sight of the whole maze and just put at the front of the maze and be able to navigate the maze when they can only see the entry point, they remember which way you have to turn to get through the maze. So there's some quite complex abilities. Um, and some of these uh, invertebrates uh, like uh, Aplysia can uh, uh, seem to have a pain system, which is quite complex. We uh, humans use them as models of pain for uh, testing uh, analgesics. 
but there's not very much uh, evidence of pain in insects and spiders so far. So at the moment, we are not including these other mollusks and insects and spiders as being, as being sentient, but that could change in the future. But if an animal is sentient, what, does that affect whether you protect it or not? Well, we still are concerned about the welfare of all kinds of animals. Uh, and less cognitive ability may mean they have more difficulty in coping. So they have more suffering because their brains don't work quite as well. It's not necessarily the case that high cognitive ability means uh, uh, less suffering. Uh, awareness also could mean more potential for imagining problems. So it's a complicated issue, but it raises questions about whether some kinds of animals have more value than others and intrinsic value than others. So should we say that animals are more valuable if they are like us than if they are very different from us? Should we say that sentient animals have more value or large ones, small ones, beautiful ones, rare ones have more value? You understand that everybody will have their views on this, but you could say they all have value or you could say uh, uh, only humans have value. If you are protecting animals, then there's not much point in trying to prevent pain using anesthetics and analgesics if they don't have a pain system. So understanding whether they have what systems they do have is relevant to how we ought to treat them. Uh, so at the end of all this, uh, I can ask you a very simple question. If you say we, who do you mean by we? It could be you only mean your own family, or it could be you only mean the people who you know, or it could mean you include all humans, or it could mean that you include all sentient animals when you say we. And perhaps we are starting to broaden our concept of we and saying that we includes a lot of other species and not just humans. These individuals which are clever and which have, uh, have the ability to have pain and anxiety and uh, pleasure, uh, maybe we are, actually, we are actually thinking of us in a wider sense. So my general conclusions are firstly, <clears throat> that the welfare of animals, including the welfare of humans can be assessed scientifically. And we need to do that when we are asked questions about, about how they should be treated. Uh, this term welfare refers to all animals but most people are more concerned to protect sentient animals. Uh, welfare is a key part of sustainability, but there are lots of other parts of sustainability. And if we are trying to assess sustainability, we ought to take account of all the components and use a scoring system to do it. So overall then what I suggest to you is that human values are changing and that there is new knowledge and this knowledge is gradually starting to affect how people are thinking, but the values probably need to change faster than they are at the moment. Uh, every, every, uh, everybody needs to think about their own values and consider whether they need to change their whole views. That doesn't mean you have to stop exploiting other species, but maybe you think about how you do it. Okay, so there are some of the References I just mentioned, since I mentioned this method for assessing sustainability, uh, that, that is a paper which has just come out a few months ago. And those are some of the books which uh, were mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to uh, discuss, ask, answer questions if you wish. It's indeed, uh, you know, all encompassing from humans down to cephalopods and to everything, even to snails, to spiders and everything. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Professor Bru. We have loads of questions for you in the chat box. Okay, I, I stop know sharing. All the participants are eager and happy to meet you today and probably would like to clear some uh, of the thoughts concerning some issues. So I would like to take some questions for you in the chat box. Um, Leslie says, is the increase in interest in animal welfare and sentience, not just because of the advance of science, but 
the decline of religious influence? Uh, well, that's a complicated question. Uh, my, my view is that there is not a, uh, uh, that all the fundamental aspects of religion must be able to take account of all the aspects of science. So religion and science are not enemies. They are not different directions because religion in order to continue and to function has to take account of science. And it, it is doing so faster in some places than others. Uh, so I, 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 I think that the development of people taking notice of science doesn't mean a decline in awareness of uh, or involvement in, in, in religion. So I, um, my, my view is that religion is very important to many people, uh, areas perhaps, but it's very important to very many people and it's, it, it's something which needs to be looked after, but religion needs to change because religion includes things which are based on historical historic information and the information now is different and re all religions need to keep up to date with what is happening and science helps religion and it is not a, a conflict but i do I, I do agree with the questioner that, uh, uh, that the increase in knowledge of science has started to change how people are thinking and i mean if you think everything on earth is provided for me personally everything is here in order to for me then you treat every other individual in a different way from if you think everything on earth is is provided for everything on earth not just for me not just indeed for my species but for all species and it, it it's just a different way of thinking and i think that will there will be changes in the way of thinking uh, and uh, but that that doesn't mean that there is uh, always a conflict between religious thinking and non-religious thinking. Yeah, thank you. I have written a, I've written a book on this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. On the evolution of, of, of morality and religion, yes. Okay, yes, yes, your book, right. So uh, Dr. Durosharo wants to know which one is more important, animal welfare or food production? Yes, they are not, again, there, there, there isn't, in general, there doesn't have to be a conflict. And so, so food production is important for the individuals who want to feed. Uh, the food production is important for the welfare of animals like uh, humans and other species. Uh, but I understand the question is uh, the background to the question because uh, the, the question is, is there a conflict between improving animal welfare and producing food? In some ways there isn't, because if the animals are kept in the best conditions, then generally they are producing better than if they are kept in poor conditions. So the worst conditions would result in them dying. That would be bad or becoming, many of them becoming disease. Clearly that nobody wants that who is trying to produce food. Uh, so then there is the question of, can you improve the welfare of animals uh, uh, and still have an economic model for producing food? And the answer is you can, and in the future you will have to, and that's because increasing numbers of consumers are demanding that the worst things for animal welfare are never used at all. So that if there is a lot of cruelty to animals, then people don't want to buy the product at all. And things which were not thought of as cruel like keeping animals in individual boxes for many months, now are illegal in more and more countries around the world. And so consumers will not buy from a company which sells something which is regarded as very negative. And that might be a big company like a supermarket. So there are people who write to the supermarket and say, if you sell meat and the animals have been kept all their lives in little boxes and their welfare is very poor, I will buy nothing from your supermarket. That causes the supermarket to develop standards in animal welfare. In the same way, people say, I won't buy from your supermarket if you are damaging the environment in various ways. So consumers are forcing the retail companies to change. And that is, that is a process which takes some time, but in the long run, it means that there is going to be better welfare for animals because the consumers are demanding it and the proportion of consumers demanding it is increasing. So 
we have two kind, we have different kinds of changes occurring, but that's a very interesting point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, based on the fact that uh, sustainability has a lot of components uh, associated with it, do you really think we can achieve sustainability? Uh, yes. Uh, and we have to, because uh, in the long run, uh, if we don't, then there will be too much damage to the world. So, however, uh, there are some things which are going to take are harder to change than, than, than other things. Uh, I mean, it is, it is really difficult for people. Uh, I, I, I have friends in the United States who live in a region which is re rather hot and people, and some of the United States is hotter than Nigeria. <laughs> but uh, they, 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 if you say to them, you are using a lot of energy with your air conditioning, and you, is it right? Is it morally acceptable? And what they say is, well, I would prefer to use less of this energy and produce less carbon dioxide, but I will be so uncomfortable that I'm not going to change. And so some of these things are quite difficult to change. And then what you have to actually do is to work out a way of running your air conditioning, which is not so damaging for the, for the planet. So you need, to, you need to have methods of cooling people which is more like what people do in Africa. They have sensible houses, more sensible than some of the houses in other parts of the world because they are designed to be better to live in, uh, in, in, in hot conditions. So one thing you do is change your uh, architecture. And another thing you do is you get the energy from uh, solar power <clears throat> instead of fossil fuel. So there are things which can be done, um, but it's, uh, it, 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 some of these things will, will, are taking quite a lot of time, but I think we have to go faster in most of them. Thank you. Julia from Brazil wants to know a little bit more about social behavior in beef cattle. That Do you think it's an important topic to study nowadays? Yes, uh, I think it's definitely an important, I mean, there, 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 is, there is quite a lot of that there is already quite a bit published on social behavior in beef cattle, but there are some important things we need to know and uh, investigating uh, how individuals interact, social behavior is, a, is, a, is, a, is certainly an important thing to do. I think that you should always, if you're going to do work in an area, you should check what is already known and then you should try to add to what is already known. I'm sure I don't need to tell Julia that, but I do think that uh, social behavior of beef cattle. Um, my, my expectation is that we will, there will be very many beef cattle produced in the future. Uh, I think the systems are going to change because the big advantage of cattle is that they can eat something which humans can't eat. So they, you can feed cattle on leaves, leaves of pasture plants, leaves sometimes of shrubs or trees. Originally cattle lived on the edge of woodland and they were eating the leaves of shrubs and trees, not just pasture plants. Um, so, but the humans can't eat them. So this is a resource which in order to exploit it, we have to have other species which can digest the leaves. Uh, the biggest product in the world is leaves. Humans can't eat. Almost all of these leaves are not usable by humans and therefore these animals which can do it, and it includes, it includes cattle, it includes fish, it includes insects. We need to be able to use these different kinds of animals. Uh, and that is going to be very important for the future. What we shouldn't do is to feed cattle on something which could be fed to humans. For example, grain. We should not be feeding cattle on grain. We should not be feeding cattle on, on, on uh, soya beans. We should be feeding cattle on something which humans can't eat. And that I think is the future, but there is a very big future in my view for, uh, for beef cattle production, but you, you do want to know how, how, how everything functions for that kind of animal, including social behavior. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering that question uh, in depth. Can you please uh, briefly explain how one welfare can be promoted in the world, especially in Africa? Yes, I, I, I think it needs to be some, for most people, it needs to be a simple message. And that is that this idea of welfare applies to 
all kinds of uh, animals, humans and other animals. And that if you understand it, you are going to, if you understand how to improve the welfare of individuals uh, and how to improve the average welfare of individuals, uh, then you are going to be able to improve the world in various ways. Uh, partly in terms of animals which are being used by humans and partly uh, improving the welfare of humans directly. Um, so I, I, I think that explaining that point is the first way to use this concept of one welfare. One welfare, one health, one biology. It, explain to people that there is only, you know, there is only one way in which things happen. Uh, it vary, there is variation, but basically we need to understand it. And uh, that uh, uh, saying that, that it's the same idea for a, for a human and for 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 a pig, or uh, or or a, a locust, uh, or or a, a fish. This is an important thing to say. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Ajani wants to know how can we how we can sensitize the African community on animal welfare, especially with regards to slaughtering in yes. abattoirs well I, I i think that the 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 first thing is to say many things are more efficient if the welfare is good so if you are, for example if you are transporting animals if you transport them in a bad way you get a less valuable product at the end you get more damage to the to the carcass you get a less good good quality meat and so Poor quality, poor welfare during transport can uh, result in a lower value product at the end. So that's the simplest thing to say. As far as as far as slaughter is concerned, if you are stunning the animals, then that is something which, in most people in the world, are saying: if we are going to use animals and if we are going to kill them, we should kill them without causing them a lot of pain. And so I think most consumers now, and, and I think it applies, it applies in Nigeria, it applies everywhere. Uh, most consumers would say we should do it without causing a lot of pain because we know these animals have a complex pain system. We also know that they can feel fear and anxiety. We ought to avoid poor welfare in the animals. So the second, second part of it is consumers are going to demand that animals are, are, are killed in a humane way rather than killed with a lot of a lot of pain and suffering and so i think those are the, the two main ways to say it and so that means that people have to change some of their practices so that they use better methods in some cases they need the better equipment to to do it and uh, the, the, it, it is to some extent related to uh, the uh, the health healthy aspects of the product as well there are other things to say there but you know the the meat quality and transmission of diseases is also related to the procedures in slaughterhouses. A good quality slaughterhouse is less likely to produce meat which has pathogens in it and so on. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Ojala, they wants to know if um, the welfare of fish is, do you think it's something difficult based on the complex nature of their habitat? Uh, I, I, th I think that, uh, the, the welfare of every animal is related to what it is adapted to. And so obviously, uh, if you live all your life underwater, then you have a big problem if you're taken into air. Uh, it's like a, 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 an animal that lives in air being put underwater. Um, so you, 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 need to, you need to think about what the animal needs, uh, which is what I said earlier, and, and fish need different things from uh, aquatic animals need different things. but. Uh, the, the aquatic environment is very complex, uh, and uh, it's it doesn't it, it it doesn't vary as rapidly as the environment in air, but it can still it is still a very complex environment, uh, and and the and fish are responding to lots of different aspects of their environment, so they are aware of the complexity of their environment, and they know what what they need from their environment, so I think that they're they're understanding how. The biological functioning of that kind of animal is a is, is an important thing in order that you can uh, improve their welfare or avoid poor welfare in that kind of animal. 
Thank you. I hope that we still have a few more questions in the chat box. Uh, I have Saba is from Sudan and he wants to know how we can assess anxiety in equine species using virtual exams. Wow. Yes, so anxiety is normally recognizable by behavioral changes. And I'm sure that anybody who is interacted with horses will have some idea of to tell that a horse is anxious. If you've never looked at a horse, you may not be able to do that. But somebody who has spent time looking at horses and interacting with horses is likely to be better at it. And if you have done a, done a, a course on equine behavior, uh, including uh, welfare, then uh, that you're more likely still to be able to do it. So I think the main way to identify uh, that an individual is anxious is to, is to identify particular behavioral changes, postures and movements in the animal. Of course, you can do it physiologically as well, but most people don't have the, they don't have the facility to, to, to take body fluid samples and so on, and to, then to do laboratory studies. And that, of, of course, also means that you only find out afterwards what they, which animals were, were anxious. But experimental studies on welfare are very helpful in terms of uh, explaining to people what, what are the effects of particular management procedures. So, and so identifying anxiety, identifying anxiety in horses is, is very, very similar to identifying anxiety in humans. How do you tell that a human is anxious? You observe their behavior mainly, you might also ask them, are you anxious? But that doesn't necessarily give you an accurate answer, does it? So you, you, are, you are more accurate by observing people's behavior than by asking them something. So uh, communication isn't, a, you, you, can, you can get information by asking people and getting their verbal answers, but they're harder to interpret because they lie or they conceal things. So the behavior is usually better than asking the person a question. Well, use the same behavior with horses or other species, or you use appropriate behavior. It's not exactly the same behavior, of course. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Maja Kodumi on the pain system. She's asking that, is the concept of pain threshold applicable to all animals? And yes. if yes, <laughs> if yes, how can we score the level of pain in animals using the facial scoring system? There have been several studies where uh, people have tried with different species of animals to, to see how much tissue damage leads to a certain kind of response which indicates pain. And on the whole, there is not much difference across species. So, you get this, you get so, so in fact, one of the best comparative studies is using electrical stimulation. Uh, using electrical stimulation, what current causes a pain response? It's actually almost exactly the same for a fish and for a rat and for a human. The amount of current which you need to cause a, 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 a significant response is very similar. Um, that doesn't mean it's identical, but, uh, but it, it is interesting that the, the concept of a pain threshold seems to apply across species and for at least for some kinds of stimulation, uh, the pain threshold is quite similar. People often have the idea that some species are not responsive to pain, uh, don't have pain because they don't respond. And th this, uh, this has been said, for example, for sheep. Well, when you, when, you, when you do something which causes a significant wound to a sheep, sometimes they don't show much response. Uh, and the reason for that is that they are trying to avoid being killed by a predator. And the, usually it's a human who's doing it and the human is a predator. So some of the responses are to conceal pain because you are more at risk if you are showing the pain. And one of the advantages of the, uh, the facial grimace, which is a very small change, but you can identify it, is that uh, the sheep, which is a species which conceals pain, still shows the facial change. Um, presumably the predators are not looking very much at that because we know, we know that a predator which is trying to uh, kill a sheep, catch and kill a sheep, 
they are they are going for the weak ones. They are going for the ones which are more likely to show a pain pain response. So, they're, but they're probably not looking at the facial changes very much. Uh, there, there's a research project there. <laughs> well, that's a whole lot to take in at once. <laughs> so, uh, a question from Dr. Duro. Can you quickly talk about positive affective states and its assessment in poultry species? Yes. Uh, if somebody asks you about your welfare, you're very often, you will think about some negative things, but you will also think about positive things. And this, the same applies to all other species. That is, uh, <clears throat> that uh, there is a balance between uh, good welfare and poor welfare, things which make your welfare better and things which make it worse. And one of the things I think which is very interesting is the is this balance to what extent are individuals uh, able to put up with something negative more if they have a positive thing to counterbalance it. And I think that does happen and it happens in, in other species, uh, all species, and you mentioned poultry, so it would happen in, in poultry. So I, I think that if you, if you put the animal in a situation which is very positive for it, then it may be that it can deal better with negative things which might be happening to it. Uh, but uh, again, research on this would be welcome. Are you still there? I can't hear anything. Okay, sorry. Okay, you've come back again. <laughs> sorry, I just didn't hear anything for a little while. Sorry for that. How can we relate the aspect of animals, health management, and animal products? Uh, well, I, quite a lot of diseases have a negative effect on production. So uh, uh, identifying diseases in animals uh, which usually means uh, that the welfare is not good because disease is very much associated with poor welfare, uh, is something which uh, is important for that individual. But obviously, it's also important when you have a, a lot of individuals which may catch, uh, which may, may get the same pathological condition. So uh, in general, production, I'm sure the, 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 the questioner is aware that in general, uh, evaluating uh, the extent of pathology is an important thing for avoiding disastrous uh, effects on, on, on production. Of course, in some cases, you can lose your whole herd of animals to, to, to a, a, a disease. So those, the things do go very closely together. And the, the, uh, all of the work on diseases is immediately relevant to welfare because the welfare of the, uh, of the individuals is, is always, it's worse when they, when they have a disease condition. Some diseases are much worse than others in terms of their impact on welfare. And that's also another interesting research area. Uh, how bad is welfare when you have different levels of disease is, a, is an important uh, research area. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you please talk more about assessment of pain in poultry species? Well, uh, poultry uh, do uh, they, they do respond to painful situations with a behavioral change, but they often also conceal it so that they are, a, because they are a prey species and because there is usually a human present and the human is a, is a, is a, is a predator, poultry do conceal the fact that they are in pain and that makes it more difficult for the uh, welfare scientists to identify uh, whether the individual is in pain. Uh, so sometimes, the, uh, sometimes there are, I mean, there are some good behavioral measurements uh, and there's a range of, range of uh, studies on this, but uh, I would say that if you are trying to assess pain in poultry, that uh, in some cases you, it, it's useful to use physiological measurements. So sometimes if you are able to measure physiological changes, uh, which might be as simple as measuring cortisol in the plasma, uh, you can identify that the individual is showing a response when it doesn't show a behavioral response. And we know, uh, we know that there are, uh, there, are, uh, there, are, there are publications on this going back uh, 40 years showing that some 
strains of poultry, which are regarded as very flighty, very uh, responsive to something negative happening to them. In other words, they show a big behavioral response. Uh, then there are other strains of uh, breeds of poultry which are show less behavioral response, but they show, uh, but when this was investigated, this was a, the earliest study was by Ian Duncan. Um, and Duncan and his collaborators found that some of these uh, strains of poultry which were regarded as being docile actually were showing a big physiological response such as a heart rate increase uh, when they were sh weren't showing very much behavioral response. So it, it is the case that you should look at a range of measures of welfare in order to identify uh, pain in poultry. And some of them need to be behavioral and some of them need to be physiological. And that's and especially when you're comparing uh, uh, poultry of, of, of different breeds and species. Yeah, thank you, Prof. I think we can just take two more. <laughs> it seems to be a whole lot of questions to answer. Mrs. Onomade is asking, how can we uh, improve uh, the welfare of zoo animals? I think the main thing to do as far as zoo animals are concerned is, first of all, there are some animals which cannot adapt to zoo conditions. They should not be kept in zoos at all. Uh, there are other animals which can adapt, provided they're given uh, conditions which meet their needs. But the trouble with zoo animals is that they are not like domestic animals. They are wild and therefore their needs are, in some cases, to have a lot of space. Uh, in, in other cases, they need to be able to hide from humans. And so there are species of animals where the best thing to, best way to keep them is so that nobody can see them because they want to hide from the people. And that, isn't, that means they're not really very appropriate to keep as a, a, as a species in a zoo uh, uh, because, because people can't see them. And then they complain that they can't see them, the animals, or, or they, they try and do something which will make them come out of their, their hiding place. <clears throat> so the answer in the long run for animals in zoos is that we should keep animals in zoos which can adapt well to the conditions and where the conditions can be provided in the zoo. Uh, and that, that, that's a general statement, uh, but it, and it means that in some species you shouldn't keep them at all, in other species you need to, to give them maybe more space or better, better quality environment. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's very obvious if it's an aquatic animal it needs to have the possibility to go in water. Those things are obvious, but sometimes people forget them. And if it's an animal which ranges over a large area, you need to give it a large area because otherwise its welfare will not be very good. So look at the biology of the animal, decide whether it's possible to keep it, and then try to provide, either don't keep it or provide for its needs. Yeah, thank you. Um... A lot of people, a lot of participants, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation and uh, saying that they've actually learned a lot from you mm -hmm. today. Uh, it, thank you so much for honoring our invitation to be our first inaugural lecturer. And we appreciate your time and your effort for what you have been doing in the field of animal welfare. Because if not for you, like starting the foundation, we wouldn't have you know, anything to, to say that we are interested in animal welfare. And I know that though this is a gradual step for us in Africa, because we are you know, still developing, just embracing this um, animal welfare as a science. So definitely it's likely gonna take us some time you know, to catch up and <laughs> with those of you in the developed world. So we will appreciate any form of assistance in, in terms of collaboration and networking, which will make us as well to be able to meet up with the level at which it is now. So I will want to say a big thank you again. And I also want to appreciate all the participants. We have a participant from different parts of the world, about 17 countries from Sudan, from UK, from Australia, from South Africa, from United Arab Emirates, from Myanmar, from Malaysia, from Kenya, well, from Uruguay, from France, from Spain, Brazil, Chile, Ireland, uh, Germany, and Canada. Thank you so much for joining us. And I also want to let us all know that the second inaugural lecture would take place on the 10th of November, 2021, same time. And this will be given by Professor Dr. Temple Grandin. 
So I hope we all join and also learn from her. Uh, thank you so much for staying all through the program. Thank you once more, Professor Broom. And nice meeting you online. Hope we'll meet physically one day. <laughs> thank you so much and bye. Let me say thank you for the honor uh, that you bestowed on me by asking me. And uh, if anybody needs to get in touch about specific issues, then um, you're welcome. Okay, let me say probably before we go, can we just uh, ask the participants, they can turn on their video at least to say one or two things, I appreciate you and just meet you. So please participants, you're free to turn on your video. If you have any, any further comments, you can please raise your hand. I can see, um, let me see, let me try to unmute, sorry. Let me try to unmute, coming. Sorry, just a... so <clears throat> you can unmute yourself. And uh, if you have any further comments for Professor Broom, you can unmute yourself. Kind the fashion row. If you are there, you can give your comments. Kind the fashion row, are you there? Doctor Hi, Dr. Prof. Okay, okay. It is nice to meet you in person. I wish to learn more from you. Thank you. Thanks, organizer. If you have any comments for Prof, feel are free. You, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Professor Drum, that was a very nice and informative presentation. I want to ask if uh, there are other areas of animal welfare and behavior that you consider important now that you never delved into? I mean, area you would have loved to research that you did not. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I would, I would, one thing I would say is that I, I have done some things in this area, but a lot more needs to be done about the, the good welfare, positive welfare. How do we identify it and how do we measure it? So that's an area for development. And also uh, in order to do that, uh, brain scanning methods are, uh, one way forward. So if you have the possibility for doing brain scanning work when animals are individual animals are doing something, then there is a, a, a big future in doing that. It's, it's very expensive work, really. You have to have quite expensive equipment. But uh, uh, you asked me what is important. I think we should use modern technology as much as we can to try to understand better uh, how good or how poor the welfare of different animals is. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Tung Sia, do you want to? Yes, um, good afternoon, Dr. Um, Prof. I want to say a very big thank you and how much I appreciate um, the effort. I have learned a lot and um, recognizing um, a group of like minds who are concerned about animal welfare is, uh, it's, I'm really happy and I want to say thank you very much to the organizers. You guys pulled out um, a good work here and uh, looking forward to the next inaugural lecture. Thank you so much, Prof. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, Jess, do you want to say something? <laughs> you are. I just want to say thank you again, uh, Professor Broom. It's been an absolute pleasure. I met you in person in, I think it was 2016 at Corsal. Hmm. And I'm the current ambassador for Corsal. And hopefully it will come back next year. It okay. has been a pleasure to enjoy spending time with you again, <laughs> even if it is in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> and it's been a pleasure to meet uh, the Nigerian group as well. You know that I have been following you closely on LinkedIn and I'm loving what you're doing. And I love, you know, you're absolutely embracing this world and it's great to come along this journey together. It's been a wonderful afternoon. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. No Julia, do you want to say something? No, just thank you, the professor. Uh, I like so much it. Listen to you. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Wait a pleasure. Anybody else? Uh, okay. Okay. Sabah from Sudan. Yes, you're raising up your hand. Yes. Unmute yourself. Unmute, Sabah. 
On mute, on mute, we can't hear you. Hello, sir, but kindly unmute yourself. Okay, yes, you can go on. Kindly unmute yourself, Saba. So any further comments? So like I said, on the 10th of November, we'll be having our second inaugural uh, lecture series and we'll be having uh, Professor Dr. Temple Grandin in our midst. That's a big one too. <laughs> so I hope to see you guys then. Thank you so much and have a lovely day wherever you are. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye. 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 Nobody has spoken.